Dr. Holly Fils, and I am going to give you a brief overview of the comprehensive examination that is required as one of your two end of program assessments in the Masters in Education and Special Education. First, I want to remind you about the CEC preparation standards. You should see these standards listed in the assignments in your coursework. These are the standards which all programs are accountable for, and it's our, our recognized program um, in special education. So these are standards that we're going to be teaching you during your program and evaluating you on at the end of your program. If you see on the slide, there are different sets of standards, and I just want to briefly give you an overview about those so you will remember um, how your program is organized and which of these apply to your particular area of specialization in your master's degree. The first set is called the CEC Initial Level Special Educator Preparation Standards. This is usually what undergraduate programs um, are, are based upon, and we use this also as kind of a frame for our programs at the master's level. We do have some of you who are seeking initial licensure, and so you want to pay particular attention to these standards. Because we have some of you who come to us from unaccredited programs or programs that aren't nationally recognized by the Council for Exceptional Children, we do use this for all, all students in our program. So that's your first stop. So you'll see when you click these links that there are seven standards and both the initial preparation standards as well as the specialty sets are organized by those seven standards. Now in your program, you selected one of four areas of specialization. Those are listed here for you. My moderate disabilities, severe or low incidence disabilities, emotional behavior disorders, or gifted education. CEC goes deeper in each of these areas to be more specific about knowledge, skills, and dispositions that teachers should have related to that particular emphasis area. So you want to make sure that you, you go a little deeper and read the specialty set for your particular emphasis area. Information. When you're writing your, your comprehensive exam responses, you will first develop a case study, and then based on your case study, you will write responses to four questions. Now, everyone has those questions from the beginning of their program, so they're no secret. So because of that, you can imagine that we expect greater depth, greater specificity, and better responses as opposed to sometimes comprehensive exams are administered by bringing you in, you don't know what the questions are, you have a specific amount of time to write, and that's your exam. Because we give them to you to do on your own, we expect better, more comprehensive responses. Like I said earlier, this exam is one of two required end of program assessments in your degree plan. The other is the comprehensive portfolio, and we have a separate uh, overview of that that you can also watch. Written comps are typically due around midterm. You want to confirm the precise due date with your major professor or your academic advisor. This due date is set by the graduate school. And extensive information about the comp exam can be found on our website, but it's also emailed to you each semester in your general advising email. So for those of you who I am your advisor, you get that every semester as an attachment. Looks like um, at some point we are going through a revision of the website, so it may not look exactly like this. But as you can see, if you go to the Department of Curriculum Instruction and Special Education website and click on Master of Education, if you scroll down, there will be uh, links to all of these things like the policies and procedures that I just spoke about, talk about the guidelines for your special education portfolio. Um, this will be replaced after this recording, so this will be a different recording. Um, how to sign up for and access TK20, which is where you will submit your application, your comprehensive exam, 
And there are a couple of things that are some tip sheets and things like that. So let's get started in what you actually have to write. So as you know, you have a content area, one of our four content areas. So your first step is to develop a case study or a description of a student in your content area. So this is your opportunity to tell us and show us that you know what a student in that particular content area may look like. So you'll tell us things like how old they are, um, kind of a little bit of history, what they're experiencing at school, maybe a little bit about their cultural background. In your case study, we do require that your case study be based on either an African American student or a Hispanic student. Um, you can add other details if you would like. Some students choose to base this loosely on a student that they are currently teaching. You may certainly do that, but I strongly encourage you to um, tweak that case study a little bit so that it is more aligned with what you're going to need to write for this exam. And of course you would need to remove any identifying information related to the student, the school, uh, the city, those kinds of things. So first you have a case study. Then you use that case study to respond to four questions. Like I said, you're going to take your time, you're going to build them on your own time. So we expect that they are um, well supported by the research. That means you're going to have references in your responses. You're going to cite them using APA format. You're going to give a reference list at the end of your comprehensive exam. You're going to uh, use APA format. So the part of what we're evaluating is your professionalism in writing. So if you don't have an APA style guide, I highly recommend that you go purchase one. So in the, the comprehensive, the, the guidelines that we give you, at the end, there are the comprehensive exam questions. And these are also going to be on the website. So you can click the, on the website and find these questions, or you can ask your advisor to share a copy of these. So as you see, there, there are directions based on your area of ex ex exceptionality. You're going to develop a case study. Then you're going to respond to each of these four questions. So if you notice, the case study is built here in question one. So in question one is where you will put your case study. Your submission de demonstrates the highest levels of professionalism. You are in a graduate program, so expect professionalism in writing. Again, follow APA guidelines for writing and citing references in all of your work. Uh, this says artifacts. This is one of the artifacts in your portfolio, so that would include your comprehensive exam. We want you to use standard English. Check your spelling, grammar. You may also want to use some kind of program like Grammarly to check your grammar and writing before submitting. Or you could also make an appointment at the center, the writing center on campus. We have one at the Hattiesburg campus, we have one on the Coast campus, and they do online appointments. So if you are concerned about your writing, I would strongly encourage you to make use of that resource. Again, don't use any identifying information about students. That would include parents, that would include schools. You also want to communicate to us, the readers, the reviewers, in a professional manner. Um, a lot of times, we want to make sure that you are using professionalism in your writing by avoiding judgments and comments or even unsubstantiated um, opinions. So when you, you're writing your response, we want to, to demonstrate respect to the people that we're writing about. So that includes other teachers, parents, and students. And pseudonyms for all students, teachers, and schools. If you do use a photo in, and this would be more aligned with your portfolio, you'll see this slide again in the portfolio clip. Anytime you use anything identifiable, you need to have written permission to do so. So failure to demonstrate professional in writing will impact your score for standard five and six.
Integrity and responses. Because everyone knows the response, the questions ahead of time, it's really important that you adhere to the highest level of academic integrity. We want you to make sure that you take care that your responses are well thought out, supported by the professional literature, and are also your responses, original responses. If you have an unacceptable level of unoriginal content, you're going to automatically fail. This is part of USM's academic integrity policy. Uh, it is also the reason that we require you to use Turnitin, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, I encourage you to use Turnitin um, in all your writing because sometimes you can even inadvertently have a little too much unoriginal content. Um, and we certainly hope that none of our students intentionally have unoriginal content. Um, so if we do determine that your responses violate the academic integrity policy and you have too much unoriginal content, then we're going to follow the university's procedures and those are outlined in the graduate bulletin. Um, we also will encourage you to review the university's plagiarism tutorial and there's a link there. Uh, for you also because, as I said, sometimes there are some things that you may be doing that you don't even realize are considered to be plagiarism. And then all graduate students also have those workplace answers modules on academic integrity that you should have completed. And is just an online software package that analyzes your response, so you'll upload your response and it will detect any kind of percentage or any kind of piece of your paper that is not original content. So it will compare your comp exam, in this case, to other research papers that students have done, to journal articles that are published, to dissertations, to theses to prior submissions of other students for this comprehensive exam. So it is very, very important that if you work with others in developing your response or get feedback from others, you make sure that your responses that you ultimately submit for your comprehensive exam is your original work. Now that leads us to the, the last bullet. Sometimes students will use uh, they'll do drafts of this comprehensive exam as an assignment for a class. And if you, if you submit using a different account, so maybe you have an account for a particular class that you submitted a draft because it was a required assignment, then you take that draft and you do some revisions and then you go into this, the Turnitin site that, that we give you for this to generate a response. Turnitin may not realize that those are both your responses, so it would be, in essence, comparing your new response to your old response. So what I tell students to do is anytime you use Turnitin, print an originality report, save it on your desktop in a folder so that you have documentation that if it is finding a lot of overlap with your own paper, you have documentation of that. it in. So you'll ha we have a link and you just click the link and it takes you to this screen. So this is kind of small here but it, in the handouts it will be larger and you can certainly print those out and look a little closer. So when you open your file, so you'll upload your document and when you open it make sure up here, see the yellow arrow, make sure that originality is clicked here. There are grade mark and other things available for you. So this paper, when we uploaded, this is a student's paper a long time ago, uh, it had a 15% match if you look over on the right upper hand side. And so when I look at your originality report, I'm going to look at the percentage match and then over here on the right side, it'll give us a breakdown of what you are matching. So notice in this student's submission, 5% of the match is something that would raise a red flag for me as a reviewer. So I would then look at that match and I'd say, well, what is it? Well, it has highlighted the question. 
Well, of course that is a match, and of course that is not plagiarism. So even though this student's paper says 15% match, I know that 5% of it is because they included the question in their responses. So in my head as the reviewer, I'm saying, well, that's not 15%, that's 10%. So anytime um, something like this happens, we, of course, exclude that. So that's why students will say, well, how much of a match is too high? Well, there isn't, we're, we can't give a percentage because everyone submits their responses a little bit differently. And so it really de depends on what the match is. Other things that might trigger a match are titles of things, like the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. I would wager that not a single student has ever turned in a comprehensive exam without that phrase being in their comps many, many times. That often pops up as a match. So again, depending on your paper, you could have a, an acceptable paper that doesn't have too many matches because all your matches are things like the questions or phrases that are common and not plagiarism in our profession. So you could have a paper with 20% match and it be acceptable. On the other hand, you could have a paper with 20% match and it be unacceptable because as we look through those matches, they really are matches with other students' papers or other things that are in the literature. So that's the reason we don't tell you it has to be below this percent. We really want the report and you have to give us the entire report so that we can see what all of the matches are and so we make a determination if this is a match or not. So as you turn these in, right now it's me, I go through, I look at the originality reports and I make a determination if it's okay to move on. If it's okay to move on, then your reviewers get your comps. So you have to submit a copy of your originality report. Please don't mix this up with a submission report. When you open the report for a submission report, it just says that this student submitted this assignment. Well, we know that you submitted your assignment. What we want is this originality report. So you're gonna make sure that originality is checked in the upper left hand corner and they make this very hard for you to see. So you're gonna look down at the bottom left hand corner of the screen and there's a little button that you press here and you're going to well, first you're going to make sure that you go and resolve any of your issues, rerun the report, and make sure that you, you have as many issues as you feel that you need to taken care of. After you've done that, you're going to save a copy of the originality report. So you're going to click on the very small printer icon at the bottom left of your screen, and then you're going to select Download PDF of Current Viewing for Printing. Then it should open up a PDF with a file that includes the matches. If you don't have a file with the matches listed, then you're not doing the right thing and you need to either call your advisor or call me or call someone that can assist you with this. So you're gonna save your PDF and you're gonna submit your originality report PDF and your comprehensive exam responses in TK20. Your exam is not submitted without both of these things. responses, you have your TK20, I mean your turn it in originality report, you submit in them both in TK20 and now they're going to be scored. So each question is scored on a scale of one to four um, and the reviewer is determining how it well it aligns with the CEC competency listed. So then you're going to give a one to four across two reviewers. Then we're gonna take those scores and we're gonna say, do you have a score that is passing and did you pass your exam? So when we're reviewing, we look at how well is it aligned to the standard? Is it supported by research? Is it comprehensive and organized well? And how are your mechanics and effectiveness of expression?
So in order to pass the exam, you must receive a rating of three or higher on each standard by two evaluators. So remember, it was a scale of one to four. So at least two people have to give you a three or four on each of the seven standards. Now what happens if you don't get a three or a four on the standard? Well, a couple of things. If you have reviewer one gives you a two, on a standard, reviewer two gives you a one on that standard, then you just, you do not pass the exam. If you get a passing score, say a three by one reviewer, but you only get a two from the other reviewer, then we have a third reviewer evaluate your exam. So if the two agree that you do not pass, then you do not pass and you don't get a third read. If one says you pass and one says you don't pass, that's when we get a third reader. So if the third reader looks and they say pass, then that's you have standards rated three or higher for two evaluators and you pass. If that third reviewer says they do not pass, then you do not pass. This exam, if you, if you have read the bulletin, which maybe you haven't, um, master students are given two attempts to meet the graduate school's comprehensive exam requirement. This written exam is considered your first attempt. If you pass, that's great. We will um, submit paperwork to the graduate school. We will give you your feedback. You'll take that feedback. It probably will, will be very minimal since you passed. And then you can then use your written responses as one of the required artifacts for standard one in your portfolio. If you do not pass, you'll get a, an email from me and we will set up some time to come and review your comp exam and we'll make a plan for what to do next. We also, you will also get notification from the graduate school that you did not pass your first attempt. So what we do next kind of varies from student to student. Um, and how close your exams were and how much work you've done on your portfolio. So what we, what we recommend is that you defer graduation and the next semester you enroll in one hour of SPE, SPE 797, that's independent study, and the, in that class you will revise your your responses with your instructor, but you will also get some help on your portfolio. Now, why do we we'd use your portfolio and talk about your portfolio here? Well, what we have found over the years is that some students are better at writing and they, they do very well on the comprehensive exam with no problem. We have some students that do better in a different medium. So the portfolio is your chance to really go a little deeper with a different kind of assessment that you may do a better job of and you, you can be successful. Now everyone has to do a portfolio, but um, it only counts as your second attempt for the comp exam if you did not pass your first attempt. So if you want to um, work on your portfolio in 797, that is a great idea because if you're not successful with your portfolio, then you are not allowed to graduate and you don't get, a, get, get your degree. So typically what we have students do, like I said, was defer graduation, enroll in one hour of SPE 797. We develop a written plan um, with some timelines and you work with the instructor to revise your, your responses to the comp exam, but to also make sure that your portfolio is developed in a way that is most likely to ensure that you're successful. Because there's revision um, and, and questions and things like that, we, we do not grade comprehensive exams or portfolios during the summer semester. This should say um, examinations, not portfolios. Sorry, guys. Um, so, if you do not pass in the spring, then you would defer graduation until fall. Whether you pass or not, summer graduates, your exams and your portfolios are evaluated in April. 
So if you um, if you're graduating in the summer, even though you will be doing work in the summer, you don't submit your portfolio in the summer. You submit in April. You submit your comprehensive exam in April. Now, what we do recommend is that summer graduates follow the same submission schedule as spring graduates, and we do that for a few reasons. Um, spring graduates submit their comprehensive exam about midterm, and so if you're a summer graduate and you submit your exam, midterm spring semester, you will know if you have passed or not passed in time to do the work on your portfolio and potentially not have to delay your graduation. Um, so we recommend that spring and summer graduates submit their comprehensive exam midterm and spring semester portfolios at the end of the summer, at the end of the spring semester so that there's a little time to do some tweaks if needed. Um, but summer graduates are only required to submit their comps and portfolios in April. So anyone, spring or summer graduates, who do not pass the portfolio will not be allowed to resubmit until the fall semester. So that's another reason why summer graduates really need to think about submitting their, their comprehensive exam questions earlier. of your comprehensive examination with a little bit thrown in about your portfolio as well and like I said we're gonna have a separate recording on the portfolio but if you need some help please schedule an appointment with your advisor um, your advisor can help you sit down look at your responses can help you map out a timeline um, you can also choose to enroll in SPE 797 uh, for one hour where you can work with one of the instructors through a course throughout the semester and get more kind of structured formal help. For either of these, you do not want to wait until the last minute, and that's the best advice I can give you. Don't wait until the last minute. The most successful students spend a lot of time developing their responses, and it's very obvious when a student has waited until the last minute to start working on this. So be proactive, be professional, be ethical, be comprehensive, and uh, you will be successful in your comprehensive exam. And most often remember that we are here to help you, but you have to give us enough time to be able to do that. If you have any questions, please contact me or contact your advisor, and we will be happy to sit down with you to clarify anything that you need some help with. All right, good luck.